I mean, most of us don't deal with the government uh, in a conf confrontational situation except at traffic tickets. I mean, we all pay our taxes, and property taxes, and sales taxes, and whatnot, and those are government intrusions on our rights, but, but it's the traffic ticket where it's a confrontational situation. So, let's um, talk with George some more about how to beat traffic tickets. All right, welcome back to course strategies that actually work. Now, here again, we're not giving legal advice. We're not attorneys. This is for informational purposes only as a community service. And we have not attended law school, so we don't even know what legal advice is. <coughs> but let's go over court strategies here. And we need to discover first the foundational principles. In the first place, uh, the judge is usually not an elected judge. We'll go over that. Secondly, they have to prove jurisdiction because they're making the claim against us. And the maxim of law says that he who makes the claim must prove the claim. There's been no injury, so technically there's no crime. Violating one of their codes is not a crime. <coughs> well, actually it, it is because the legal definition of crime is a violation of public policy. And you see, the words public policy are any codes, ordinances, and stuff like that that they write. But you'll notice that it's not the violation of the law. <laughs> so. Right. That's the legal definition. But as we brought out in the last uh, meeting, there's a vast difference between what's lawful and what's legal. Now, uh, we, we should discuss the other part there, the first one you have where the judge is not an elected judge. Very few judges at the courthouse are elected. I mean, maybe less than half of them are elected. And the ones that do traffic court are definitely the, you know, lower on the list and not elected. They're usually commissioners, you can tell by the word. And what's the importance of having an elected judge, George? Well, by the California Constitution, we are uh, have the right to be heard by an, an elected, duly elected judicial officer is the legal term. We'll get into that. But also, there's uh, no real party in interest. In other words, who's coming after us? Is it the officer? Is it the state? Is it the DA? Is it the judge? We have to explain that. And the real party of interest is the person who's been injured. They have a person. They've suffered a personal injury or loss. Exactly, and who, and who suffered that injury by our going five miles over the speed limit? And then, of course, uh, the oath of office of most, if not all, of the elected officials and the appointed officials are defective. The charging instrument, which is the actual paper that sets the charges against you, is not only defective, most of the time in traffic cases, it's not even there. And that is the crux of our strategy. You can call it the charging instrument strategy. And of course, there's no contract. This is not a judicial court. This is an administrative court. They don't tell you that, but we are led to believe that it's official. I mean, after all, those judges wear those black robes, right? And they have the seal in back on the wall behind them and the flags. The officer wears a nice press uniform every day with a shiny star. Uh, and they sit three feet off the ground, which intimidates the hell out of me. Yeah, the judges do. Uh, the, those officers drive fancy painted cars, special colors with fancy flashing lights. It looks official, but is it? And that's what we're going to get into here. So uh, those are the principles, the strategies that we're going to use is to challenge jurisdiction. 
challenging jurisdiction is the prime strategy that consistently works. And we have to understand if we hire an attorney to represent us, we automatically give up personam jurisdiction. There's such a thing called subject matter jurisdiction that uh, can never be given up, but we've already lost half the battle if we hire an, an attorney to represent us. Personam jurisdiction is jurisdiction over your body. Over the person, right. So to do that, Number one, we don't cross the bar. We'll get into the reason for doing that. We'll first describe what the bar is. Yes, the bar is that uh, long rail kind of wall, a low, low a wall in that separates the, the good folks from the bad folks. Yeah, exactly. So the judge and the district attorney are on the other side of the bar, and if we imagine the bar is like it's a sh the whole of the ship and we're walking the plank to get onto the ship. So when you cross the bar, it's that little opening where you cross and you go in so that the judge can speak to you in his own little chamber there. And apparently he I can't hear you if you're outside the bar because when you state that you start talking to him from outside the bar, he will be very determined to get you to cross the bar and come in where he can hear you. And that all has to do, of course, with jurisdiction. There are a million ways that they trick us into giving it jurisdiction. Crossing the bar, stating the name, or answering to the name, that is, which sounds like your name, but is actually the name on their piece of paper spelled in all capital letters. It's actually the name of the defendant. Exactly, the defendant. And we have to make a distinction here between yourself and a defendant because un unless you agree you're the defendant then uh, you're not. Uh, we have to go in therefore by what's called special visitation which is a special way of coming before their tribunal without giving up jurisdiction because if there's such a thing as special and there's such a thing as general special appearance and a general appearance. If you go in in general appearance, then you give automatically give up personam jurisdiction. If you go in specially, then the me mere fact that you're going in under special appearance is uh, to challenge jurisdiction, and of course they know all this. And clarify issues that you have with the court rather than answer to the charges directly. Right. We uh, accept their oath on the record and actually we challenge their oath as well uh, as to its sufficiency because most of the, if not all actually today, of the government officials don't take the proper oath. We ask for the elected judicial officer who we require to see the charge instrument. Uh, we require them to produce the contract we require them to define who the real party and in interest is. And then we finally make a final statement. If they haven't given up by that time, we make a final statement uh, on the record. So we're using statutory uh, means to do this. In other words, we're basically using their rules against them. They have a set of rules that they must follow. Otherwise, there's such a thing called due process which a violation of automatically uh, voids. requires dismi dismissal. Voids the case. That's right. And there are numerous uh, United States and Supreme Court rulings to that effect. Because they've taken an oath to the Constitution, they are required to follow Supreme Court and uh, District Court rulings. So we also well, let's, let's um, expound on the strategies a little bit. So the first one, the challenging jurisdiction, you know, what is jurisdiction? Jurisdiction has been defined uh, a lot, again, in the case sites. But what it basically comes down to is control. Jurisdiction is control. If, 
If they have jurisdiction over your life, then they have control over your life. Now, not absolute control, obviously, but uh, w certain aspects, for instance, relative to uh, driving, which is a commercial statutory term, relative to motor vehicles, another statutory term, and so forth. So if you admit to driving a motor vehicle, then they have jurisdiction over you. Well, Bill Thornton makes has a paper where he describes jurisdiction. I think it's a very interesting description. And that is that um, it's uh, Latin, and the words juris and diction, generally the word juris is law, and diction would be spoken, right? So it would be spoken law. But what he claims is that back in the feudal days, you know, in the early 1200s and 1400s and 1600s, jurisdiction was an oath spoken or a pledge. So if you pledged yourself to the feudal lord, the lord had jurisdiction over you because of that pledge, that contract. So we look at a jurisdiction as a um, something here. If you're a free man, then no one has jurisdiction over you because you're free to go about your business and do as you will. The only time when jurisdiction arises is when you've um, committed a trespass on somebody or violated a contract, and that other person can now have the sheriff hold your body to answer, which would be, we have jurisdiction over you, because you committed this act. Until you commit the act that grants us jurisdiction, we don't have jurisdiction. If you had jurisdiction over somebody all the time, they would be your slave, wouldn't they? I mean, for me to say that I have jurisdiction control over somebody else all the time because you live on a certain street or you know, you're a certain age or you have a certain piece of identification in your pocket, that grants me jurisdiction. That would not be true because slavery is outlawed, so we can't have jurisdiction constantly. So jurisdiction can only arise when you've injured somebody, and at that point, a party would have jurisdiction over you. Very well. So our strategy, in applying a strategy, uh, for one thing, we do write paperwork, and some of this was presented the last time. We'll just quickly review that. And the strategy is for them to prove their claim because the maximum law is who, he, who makes a claim must prove that claim. And finally, we get into oral argument. If the uh, initial paperwork does not prevail, then of course we have to go into court and uh, defend ourselves. So our, in the strategies under A, do not cross the bar, that is a, another jurisdictional issue. Uh, present by special visitation, B is another jurisdictional issue, and C, oath of office on record, if the party, if the judge doesn't have an oath of office on record, then he has no jurisdiction over you because he can't act as an officer. If he's not an elected official and you challenge him on that, then he has no jurisdiction over you. So almost all of these are jurisdictional challenges that you have to understand. The charging instrument is another jurisdictional issue because if there's no charging instrument, you can't answer to any um, trespass. I mean, the charging instrument is supposed to be a claim that you have violated the law. And it has to be a valid claim in order for you to be able to plea to it. So if there's no valid charging instrument, then they have no jurisdiction because, as I stated, jurisdiction is acquired when you've broken the law, and we're talking common law. The elected official um, position is, you know, maybe George can explain that. It's, it's a uh, constitutional uh, right that you have to be heard by an elected official, but you have to make the claim in order to get it. You have to make any claim in order to have them uh, 
consider it. And that's why we bring up everything we, we possibly can to challenge their jurisdiction. So uh, I think we can go forward there with the court script at this point. We're, the application uh, has to do with the written paperwork. And the written paperwork initially is responding within three days uh, to their claim by refusing for cause their right. yeah, canceling the contract by refusing for cause uh, due to fraud and they will never give you a cause because then they would expose themselves and then it comes down to proving your claim uh, and along with the paperwork the initial paperwork we also make up an acceptance of oath of the actors, the government actors, and uh, we also work up either a notice and demand, which is in common law, or we uh, work up a demur jurisdiction, giving a lot of points and authorities, so that's unassailable, basically. See. Yeah, common law free man does not make motions to the court for the judge to decide. The common law free man makes notices and demands. A notice is making them aware of something that, so that they can investigate and do due diligence and not get stuck. And a demand is that you perform a requirement. If you ask, if you put in requests, they can deny them. But if you, if you make it a requirement that they answer, then they, they will go into dishonor if they don't answer. And that's a very good point. Uh, if you hire an attorney, they will use motions. And a motion is basically uh, begging, it's requesting the court. And they can basically rule any way they want in that respect. So the first thing that happens uh, when you get that ticket is you send back three copies, you make a color copy front and back um, with red ink marker right across them, refuse for cause. I would use res red pen because my experience is red in ink marker is way too hard to read. But get yourself a red pen. And over the face of it, just uh, at an angle. We, all, we have templates and things that, that you can, so you send those back, you, uh, w w the one to the officer that made the presentment, one to the prosecutor, which is usually the DA, the district attorney, and one to the court. Clerk of the court. Clerk, clerk of the court to file with a letter say, uh, to the effect that y y you're filing this because you want to prevent a fraud in the court. Now. The officer really at that point is required to notify the court that there's no case because there's no contract. You've just rescinded it, canceled it, but they never do. So that's why we have to go in and preserve our rights and make sure there's no fraud in the court. And that's the strategy we're using is going in um, on that basis. So the first thing in court is that we do not cross the bar. When the name is called, and it sounds like your name, but it's actually spelled in all capital letters, that all capital letters signifies that that's an artificial entity. All capital letters is actually corporation. That's the way the corporations are uh, denoted. So when we go to, uh, we can go up to the bar, <coughs> And uh, the judge will say something like, uh, come forward, or uh, something of that nature. When he says that, you can say something like, thank, uh, thank you for your offer. I will cross the bar and enter your vessel if you agree that I reserve all my unalienable rights and re uh, waive none. Unalienable is a very important word. It means that our rights cannot be leaned means that we can't give them away even if we wanted to because they are from our Creator. 
Now, I had a friend uh, say this, and the judge kept insisting that they're inalienable rights. Well, that's not what the Declaration of Independence says. The Declaration of Independence specifically says unalienable, and those two words are quite different. Unalienable means they're absolutely not alienable. Uh, inalienable means that they can be leaned, can be given up. So the principle here is you never ever refuse because that's a dishonor. You always accept but conditionally. I'll cross the bar, Your Honor. Actually, I, call, I don't call him Your Honor. I don't call him Judge. I call him Sir or Madam. I will cross uh, the bar, Sir, so long as you agree that I retain all of my unalienable rights and waive none. And they might ask you uh, two or three times, but usually they, they give in uh, certainly by the th third time on that because uh, they know that to proceed uh, would be futile. I mean, what judge would like to be known f to be the guy who denied a person his rights in court? That's right, in, in, uh, on the record. The judge will try to intimidate you uh, into giving jurisdiction uh, by saying something like, if you do not come forward, I cannot hear you. <clears throat> Don't fall for that. Stay on point. State your conditional acceptance again. And keep saying that until the judge agrees. Just yell at him. Make fun of him. <laughs> That's a good point, too. Because if he doesn't and keep or keeps evading, uh, then you'll be presumed to have no rights and be under their jurisdiction. And this is a very important point because if we do not stand up for our rights, nobody else will. If we do not stand up for our rights, we don't have any. And you have to claim them in a timely manner. You have to claim them when you need to claim them. Otherwise, you waive them. That's right. That's why it's so important to learn a, a very major word, and that is object. I object. Objection. And sometimes they'll say, well, why are you objecting? Unless it's patently clear. And so you have to know uh, how to answer that. Now, as an alternative, you can stay outside the bar and continue, and I've had friends who did that. And that's not a problem either. So, uh, we next go to <coughs> special visitation. And this is the way that you st make your first statement. For the record, I am here in this matter by special visitation to challenge jurisdiction only. I am not here to plead or to testify, and I do not swear to oaths. Nothing that I have said or may say shall be construed to, as consent to contract with you or this in instrumentality. I do not consent to these proceedings. And you get that on the record. Now, special visitation is actually a, a common law uh, principle. You can say, I'm here by special appearance or restricted appearance, and that's uh, Rule E8 of the Federal Rules of Procedure. And that's fine because, after all, we're are doing this statutorily, and so we're not concerned whether it's uh, technically common law or statute. We're using their rules against them. But at that point, the judge and everybody involved there will clearly understand that you're challenging your jurisdiction. That's all you're there for. Now, they're going to try to rope you into consenting to their jurisdiction by saying something like, uh, well, how do you plead or well, no, the first thing they're going to do is, if you say, I'm here on that matter, they're going to say, well, who are you? Because what they're going to try to do is to get you to c convince you that, that, um, <coughs> that you have to give your name. And if you say, it, let, let's say um, the name is John Doe, of course the defendant in the case is John Doe in all capital letters. And when you say, I'm John Doe, what he's hearing is that you're John Doe in all capital letters. 
He's not hearing your John Doe in upper and lowercase letters. You're, the, you're not the living soul. You're there to speak on behalf of the fiction, the defendant. So the first thing he'll do, if you say, is to try to get you to give him the name. And if you're going to give him the name, which I mean at some point you probably will, then you're going to say, you know, my name is John Doe, capital J, small O, small H, small N, capital D, small O, small E, and I am not the defendant in this matter, and there's no evidence to the contrary. Okay, do so you have any proof that I am the all capital name? They're going to say, fine, uh, step forward, Mr. Doe. And the minute you say, okay, fine, what would you say to that, George? Well, when they say Mr. Doe, Mr. is an address. They're addressing you as Mr. Doe, not in your true name, but in, again, the corporate name. Now, just to give you an idea of how important that name is, uh, after you say your thing about being there by special visitation, only to challenge jurisdiction, you can then say, on and for the record, give me your name, please, uh, speaking to the judge, both uh, the judge and the prosecutor. Now, they're not going to give you their name, because if they did, they would be giving you jurisdiction, and you could dismiss the case uh, at that point immediately. So they're going to play around. They're going to say something, well, uh, I'm Judge Smith. My favorite is, it's not about, it's not about me, it's about you. <laughs> right. So they're going to dance around that, evade the question, because if they told you their name, again, the case is over. You could uh, dismiss it at that point immediately. So you can play along with them as well. You can say, is your name uh, John Smith? Yes or no? And if he evades that, you can Im implement a, a famous court case called U.S. versus Tweel by saying, according to U.S. versus Tweel, by which Supreme Court decision you are bound according to your oath of office, on and for the record, let the record show that in the absence of a negative response, John Smith answers in the affirmative. In other words, you're answering for him by tacit consent. He who fails to deny consents. Exactly. Now, uh, you do not answer to the name directly because you are then certifying the, uh, the charges to the court by testifying what your name is. It gets pretty involved here because what's really happening is that they are creating a constructive trust and appointing you trustee by which terms you are required to perform. A trustee is always required to perform. Unless a trustee can show that he, he has a paid receipt to the beneficiary, then he's liable. And we, we're not going to go into that, but just keep that in mind that, that the games that they play are so deep, the rabbit hole runs so deep that it's uh, mind-boggling how they've set this thing up. And that's why the Constitution does not apply. You often hear judges say, don't bring up the Constitution or hold you in contempt. The Constitution does not apply here. So in order to uh, avert that, you need to get their oath of office on the record. Well, the Constitution doesn't apply because you didn't sign up for it, did you? I mean, you're not a signer to the Constitution, so there's no contract with you. However, one person who did contract is the judge and the DA and the sheriff and the policeman and every elected or appointed official. Are, they are required to take an oath to the Constitution. Now, the oath becomes an offer. The oath is I promise to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Sounds like an offer to me. All it's waiting for is my acceptance in writing. So I go down and get a certified copy of the oath of office and write across it in red pen, I accept your oath of office as a binding contract. Now we have a contract where he can't say the Constitution doesn't apply in my courtroom. 
hey, you offered, I accepted, that's a contract. Right, and that's uh, point three on the uh, outline there. You can show them the acceptance of the oath that you would put into the record. There's the acceptance of the oath right there. Now I've had friends uh, put this into the record and they've been successful because uh, here again, once you accept their oath, then they are required to follow the Constitution. If you don't accept their oath, then they're going to presume that they're not required to follow, follow the Constitution. And this is a good uh, thing to put in if you can't to get a copy of their oath and write across it, accept it, as, as Jeff uh, pointed out. W but once they're on the hook, then uh, they have to be cognizant of your rights. Now, one judge uh, said, well, I don't agree to this. Well, guess what? You committed perjury on your, on your oath then. <laughs> That's right. So are you in your private capacity? Have you vacated the office? That's what you asked them. Because it's not uh, a contract offer to them. It's accepting their contract offer, which they have put already by signing that oath. That oath has consideration, that contract has consideration by the, the uh, payment of their office. Uh, there is a meeting of the minds there because the uh, judge obviously, or the officer, whoever signed that oath, obviously uh, uh, looked it over and, and accepted it. And if you understand what he means when he said, I, I pr promise to honor the Constitution, okay. It's full disclosure. We both understand what we're talking about. Or was there some other constitution you were promising to honor? So the oath is uh, very important. And when I brought up the subject of the oath, uh, before I learned about this, uh, without giving them the uh, acceptance uh, per se, the, their entire demeanor changed. So you can next uh, challenge their capacity as uh, being elected. For the record, are you a duly elected judicial officer? <coughs> and they will generally uh, say no, in which case uh, you say, according to the California Constitution, which you took an oath to uphold, and here again we bring in that oath, it's very important. Article 6, Section 21 states that I have a right to be heard by a duly elected judicial officer. I do not stipulate to a judge pro tem. Therefore, please disqualify yourself for cause. And I respectfully demand a duly elected judicial officer to hear this matter. I always call it a matter. I don't hear it. A, I call it a case because uh, they don't have a case and you don't want to give them a case unless they jump through all the hoops, improve jurisdiction, and, and due process. Yes, you don't consent to it being a case. Exactly. Uh, here in this county, the traffic court is downstairs, and all the uh, sheep are herded in there. They're often uh, brought before the judge in groups if they have all the same uh, violation or something of that nature. Uh, you never accept that. You never uh, stipulate to that. You always object. But once you challenge the standing of the judge to hear the case beca because he's, uh, they're not elected, they will s send you upstairs to a uh, duly elected judge. <coughs> and here's this stupid little traffic ticket before this elected judge who's hearing felonies and murders and robberies and things. He's saying, what the hell is this traffic th thing doing here? Uh, well, guess what? Uh, that's exactly what you want them to understand. They're, they're going to want to get rid of that thing right away. It's not worth their time because it's not... Uh, uh, they're making big money. Exactly. <coughs> they're they're, they're with the, the penal sums for murders and robberies are huge compared to um, 
dinky traffic tickets. And they get a part of that action, by the way. Yes, and that's a, a conflict of interest. So you then, at, at that point, proceed uh, to the charging instrument. Once you get before the elected judge, and here again you do crossing the bar, <coughs> you do an oath of office, and all that previous, but now you're before an elected judge. And so you ask the uh, DA, because the DA is the one that's supposed to prove the charges. <coughs> do you have the charging instrument? And they generally will not. Uh, the traffic cases almost never ever have the charging instrument. So immediately the judge has to dismiss. Do you have the, because if the judge asks you to plea, sometimes we'll, he'll say, well, how do you plead? You have to say, well, to what do I plea? Where are the charges, you know? Am I supposed to plead to you, to heaven, you know, to the DA? There has to be a charging instrument to plead to. There That's the law. Yes, there has to be an accuser. And the charging instrument basically comes from constitutional law. It's like the Fourth Amendment. In order to have your person, property, etc., seized, you need an oath or affirmation, sworn. Bef sworn. So an oath is a sworn, uh, sworn testimony. For a charging, com for a complaint to be valid, it has to be uh, you. The complaining party, the accuser, has to swear before somebody who's able to hear the complaint. And under Penal Code 872A, basically, if you're arrested, they're supposed to take you before a magistrate, and the magistrate hears the complaint of the party. Now, if, let's say you saw your neighbor hit somebody over the head with a baseball bat. Your sworn testimony would be taken down before a policeman, and then the policeman would go before the judge and said, I have, I personally witnessed the testimony of Bob Rowe, who stated that this man here hit him over the head with a baseball bat. So the testimony would be Bob Rowe to the police officer. The police officer would be the one hearing the testimony. In a traffic case, there, so there has to be two signatures, in other words. There has to be the party making the accusation, and there has to be some competent person like a notary, a judge, a police officer. There's only so many people that are allowed to technically be able to take a, uh, hear a complaint um, testimony. testimony and witness it. And you know, like a notary witnesses the testimony. Well, a, a judge can witness testimony. Man on the street, I can't witness testimony, right? not for a lawful complaint. So the complaint has to have two signatures on it, and since the traffic ticket is what they use as the complaint, it's the accusatory complaint, but there's no two signatures on there. There is the officer's oath, and where he signs it, it'll be under penalty of perjury. So he's swearing under penalty of perjury, but he's not swearing before a party that is capable of hearing his testimony. And since he arrested you, let's go back to that, Point that he arrested you, he detained you, you were under arrest when you were stopped. The Fourth Amendment rule applies. You can't take, you can't seize my body without an oath or affirmation, and that has to be sworn testimony before somebody capable of hearing it. So this is why the um, charging instrument complaint is a very valid one. So the charging instrument is central to everything. Without that, they have no jurisdiction, they have no case, end of game. So you have to bring that up. Uh, an attorney will never bring that up, never. Because if he does, he's gonna get disbarred. An attorney is there only to bring business into the court. You have to understand that attorney is an officer of the court. He gets his license to practice from the court, he gets his business from the court, and uh, so his first priority, of course, is himself. The second priority is the court, and if you come along somewhere down the line, then uh, whether you win or lose, you know, isn't very important because he's going to get paid either way. 
and his first oath is to the court, not to you, his client. His client, that's second on the list. Exactly. So that's why it is so detrimental to hire an attorney. What they generally do is they cop a plea. Well, you can do that yourself. You don't have to pay them 2000 or 4000 or however much they're going to charge you just to cop a plea. So the charging instrument uh, is the most important point here. And we need to understand its significance. We need to understand how to demand it properly and not be blown off. We have to stay on point. The judge is going to say, well, uh, <clears throat> John Smith, you've, you've been charged uh, with uh, speeding 20 miles over the limit. That's a serious charge. Excuse me, sir, but do you have a charging instrument or not? That's, what, that's your only response. Yes or no? If not, then please dismiss this matter with prejudice. That's what you have to say. Because dismissing it with prejudice means they cannot refile the charges again. When, when, when you're in court there, even though it's a traffic case and you think it's like no big deal, it's an arraignment. Because anytime you're, they're asking for a plea, you're being arraigned. They're going to have the arraignment at the trial at the same time. However, the bottom line is that if you, you can't go straight to trial until you've pled not guilty or guilty or no contest. So if it's an arraignment, Penal Code 988 says that you have a right to receive a copy of the charging instrument, but in a misdemeanor and in, a, in an infraction, which a traffic ticket's an infraction, it would be only if you ask for it. In other words, if you don't ask for it, they don't have to give it to you. They don't have to show it to you. If you ask for it, they have to give you a copy of the original. If there's a copy they give you that's unsigned, then there's no complaint. So if they're going to say that the traffic ticket is the complaint, then the, there's no two signatures on here. So it's not a valid uh, complaint, as opposed to criminal. There's either criminal or, or civil, and traffic tickets don't fall into either one, but that doesn't matter. If they're asking you to plea, it's got to be in an arraignment. Yes. And we need to talk about what an arraignment is. Uh, they'll tell you that an arraignment is where you uh, are read the charges and your rights and that you're asked to plead guilty or not guilty or sometimes they plead no, no low contendere, which means uh, you're... No contest. No contest. You're, uh, not, you're not admitting guilt, but you're not... Uh, you, you're not contesting the uh, charges. So that's what they're going to tell you. But in actuality, an arraignment is for the specific purpose of getting your consent. That's all it is. Establishing the jurisdiction of the court over you. Exactly. And that's why they play these games, is to trick you into answering to the name, which would give them jurisdiction, into not uh, demanding the charging instrument, which would uh, automatically give them the, the, the win of the case. And, of course, they're not going to tell you these things for the very reason that the whole thing is a scam. It's a fraud. A big moneymaker. It was a court case or law, law that says that uh, a part of the revenue from tickets and so forth goes to the courts. And that's a conflict of interest right there. Yeah, that's actually written into the code. If you look it up, there's a code that states, like Lockyer Eisenberg Trial Court Funding Act, states like 10 or 15 percent of the monies that get collected in the courts go back to fund the courts. Well, that's a conflict of interest. I mean, if you're going to hear the case and you get more money if there's more convictions, I don't know. That's about as fraudulent as you can get. So. You should start to be getting outraged at this point because uh, the, there's no injured party. I mean, going five miles over the speed limit injures whom? You see, what actually what they stand on is that it injures uh, the public policy, the, the codes. And so that's why they're coming after us for those petty any kind of things. Now. They should drop it right now, especially if you're in front of uh, 
a knowledgeable a knowledgeable uh, elected uh, j judicial officer especially if you don't have a uh, complaint and I've had several of these drop because of that but if they continue to proceed then you need to uh, get out the heavy guns here and I would suggest that you write up either a notice of demand or a demur with all the sites uh, and so forth to file into the case at that point and and we have uh, templates for this if you're interested but with these filings uh, they have no where to go because there's literally hundreds of sites that uh, annihilate their claim of jurisdiction so you're at five here the plea yes if the judge asks you to plea say sir do I have a right to understand the nature and cause of the charges against me before I make a plea? This is straight out of the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution. If you don't have a copy of the Constitution, you're flying blind. I highly recommend you bring your pocket Constitution to court with you as proof and evidence. Because if you remember what to say, that's, that's nice and everything, but if you have a book that has um, the legal court cases and whatnot in it, that's the only evidence that is admissible. So if you have a pocket constitution, it's admissible evidence. So you just show them the Sixth Amendment where it says you have the right to know the nature and the cause of the charges against you, at which point he could say, well, this really isn't a criminal trial. Oh, okay, <laughs> if it's not a criminal trial, what form of law is being practiced in the courtroom today? Because the Constitution only lists four, law, four forms of law, and I'd like to know which one you're using. If it's admiralty or maritime, since this didn't happen at sea, they couldn't be admiralty or maritime, so it has to be common law or equity. And is it common law or is it equity? And if it's equity, show me the contract that I violated. Actually, it is equity. They're presuming there's a contract when you applied for the driver's license, and when you applied for the registration, and when you applied for the insurance. Application, again, here is begging. You're begging them to give you a privilege to drive in substitution of your common law right to travel. That's why driving is a privilege, traveling is a common law right. We're talking law versus legal here, again, or lawful versus legal. So, but for it to be a valid contract, there had to be a meeting of the minds, and since they didn't explain to you that you had the right to travel, the, co the driver's license contract would be invalid. But let's say it was valid. You still have to be driving a motor vehicle for it to apply. And as we pointed out, the definition of motor vehicle was never substantiated. So they couldn't prove in court that you were driving a motor vehicle. And if they want to use your testimony that you signed it up as a motor vehicle, then you just rebut it by saying, well, you know, I was unaware and unschooled in the law at that point, and nobody informed me that, a motor, that I didn't have a motor vehicle if I had to do it over again, which I'm saying my intention at the time when I signed was that I was not being paid in commerce and that I was, you know, so if those questions were on there, I would have answered them correctly, but, but they weren't. But they're not going to go there because that would expose the fraud. And they've got 50 other people that are happy to pay the fees exactly. sitting behind you. So uh, the plea is very important. Y you never, ever plead. If you plead, then that means you've just given them jurisdiction because you recognize their authority. And when they demand that you plead and you, and you, do, and you follow their co uh, demands, then you recognize their authority. When you do that, you give them jurisdiction. You never, ever plead. So you, you say something, uh, I, do not, I do not understand. They're going to say, they're going to read you the rights, your supposed rights, and they're going to say, do you understand? Well, that word understand here again is another a secret code catchphrase. It doesn't mean do you comprehend, it means do you stand under, do you accept the charges? Therefore you say, I do not understand. Well, they're going to say, well, what the, don't you understand? I, I mean, you've been charged with uh, speeding, uh, what's the problem? You're going to say, I don't understand any of it. I do not stand under these charges. And then they will very clearly see that, that you uh, comprehend.
the other thing to note is that um, the penal code allows the judge to plead for you if you refuse to plea. So you have to state unequivocally on the rec record that I am not refusing to plead. I do not have anything to plead to. The court hasn't established that it has jurisdiction and there's no valid charging instrument for me to plead to. So basically we're going down the line, we're going down the line with these uh, uh, points and you have a chance to blow their case apart at every one of these points. So if you fail in one, you always have the next one coming up. Now if the judge pleads for you, you can say, well, I uh, uh, revoke the plea pursuant to Penal Code 1018 and I demur. And you can do that. And or you can just accept it and say that since the judge is a lawyer and he should know well that if he pleads and speaks for the defendant in court, he has just shown his willingness to represent the defendant. So you just accept it and say thank you very much for your showing your intention to defend the defendant in court and accept surety for the defendant. In other words, you're going to accept surety, pay all the bills for the defendant. Now, since this is a court of equity, there has to be a contract. And you can demand that. You can say, please uh, uh, take a judicial cognizance of my affidavit. In other words, before you go to court, you, always, you, you can always uh, file an affidavit. And this especially works well for, for dis misdemeanors. Uh, and you, then you can say, uh, please produce the underlying contract in, the, in this matter because I wish to do, dispute the contract. They cannot because uh, to do so would expose a scam. Uh, moving on quickly, uh, there's always three questions you can ask. <clears throat> what is the nature of the charge? What is the cause of the charge? What is the jurisdiction of the charge? If you ask these three questions, I've heard that uh, a number of cases have been dismissed just by asking these because they expose, again, that uh, they have no jurisdiction, there's no contract, and they cannot answer them properly. And then finally, uh, you can ask for a complaining party. Is there evidence of a complaining party? Well, he's going to say the the people of the state of California or something of that nature. Can they meet the ones that are complaining? In which case you can reply to, I did not ask who is the complaining party. I asked for evidence of the complaining party. Please bring forth the evidence if you have it. And they don't. It it's, uh, goes back to the real party and interest. Who actually is bringing the charges? The people of the state of California? Who's that? please uh, produce that uh, complaining party or evidence thereof, and, and they can't do that. Yes, they'd have to actually produce somebody who could claim that they have suffered an injury or a loss, and they can't do that. Or someone who represents the people of the state of California. Now, the uh, district attorney, the prosecutor, is going to claim that he represents the people of the state of California, but then you show him, you ask him for... The, his, his delegation of authority, and he, he can't produce that. Yeah, does he have signed power of attorneys from everybody in the state to represent them? So the basic point is that they have no case. There are, there are so many holes in their, in their supposed case that it's like a sieve. And any one of these uh, defects is fatal to their case. So we'll... Uh, uh, if, if it gets this far, and it should not even come close, you can make a final statement to the district attorney. You have not brought forth a valid charge instrument or, or uh, certify the charges. You, you do not have, you have not produced evidence of a complain, complaining party. You've not produced the underlying contract in this matter. Therefore, do you have any facts or admissible evidence that you have both in personam and subject matter jurisdiction in this matter? Yes or no? And you can bring in U.S. versus Trill again 
as we did with the judge before. Then my public business is finished here. Please release the order of the court to me immediately. Now, you need to know what this is all about. The bottom caveat there is very important. Warning, do not know, use this if you do not completely comprehend it. You need to know because the judge is going to test you. That's why he's there. He's going to weed out the pretenders. And if you're a pretender, then it's going to go very badly for you. Yes, Therefore, remember, it's Satan's job to tempt you. Exactly. Therefore, you need to know the law, and you need to know how to express it. Uh, you'd be well advised to practice the court script, to, to bone up on the uh, statutes, rules, and regulations, the penal codes that we have cited, the court cases that we have cited, so that you can spot them out. Because if you know it that well, they know that they have some of the, they, they cannot uh, hoodwink. You should write everything out on a piece of paper and bring it to court with you because you're not going to be able to remember all this. And if you want to read uh, penal code numbers and stuff into the record, have it written out on a piece of paper. When you get the piece of paper, you can read your opening statement off the piece of paper. You can know what, you know, you can prearrange like a chess game. The judge is going to ask you this question and then you're going to have your answer to that question. You know, he's going to ask you, are you going to represent the party? He's going to read the charges. He's going to ask you if you understand the charges. He's going to ask you to enter a plea. That's the biggie. And then you're going to have to know how to react to those things, what to say. And if you write it out on a piece of paper, pray to God when you go in there. Relax. You'll be fine. Have fun. Most of all, have fun. Uh, to quickly summarize, uh, when you go to court, you don't cross the bar. You do not plea. You ask for the charge against them. That's the most important thing. So our time here has come to an end, and we are happy to present this information to you and hope you will research more on how to fight your traffic tickets because it can be done, and George has been successful numerous times. I've been successful. Other people we've helped have been successful. Success is fun. Besides which, when you go to court, this is an opportunity that you won't get anywhere else where if you lose, you're going to pay what you're going to pay anyway. So you're going to pay the couple hundred dollars, but you get the opportunity to stand up for yourself and demand your rights. Love's the highest power. Thank you for watching. God bless. And remember, have consideration for everyone else out there.